All right, thank you. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to make this presentation. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to cover these two topics to discuss the recent trends and price outlook uh, and what those risk management options are. I'll give you a couple examples of some tools and an application of some price insurance program. And secondly, to discuss the longer term outlook as you all make plans and decisions and looking at investment decisions into your operation. In the general theme in the U.S. cattle market is that there's been a slow recovery in cattle numbers and that slow recovery in cattle numbers is starting to affect markets and outlook. And so we'll look at that over the next uh, couple slides. And so here is a very interesting graph of cattle numbers, January 1 beef cow inventory reported by the USDA. And so in the blue line is Washington and the red line is U.S. beef cow uh, her numbers. And the interesting point is that when Washington, from the peak to the decline, we de decreased at twice the rate of the U.S., twice the rate our decline in the beef cow numbers. And you can see that recovery in cow inventory and beef cattle numbers in the U.S. In the U.S., it started in 2015 and then continued in 2016 at about 3%. But in Washington, I'll, sh I'll give you some more numbers, a uh, really sharp increase in 2016. Really interesting how we uh, increased in 2016. And so here's a map. Uh, kind of really interesting to look at this map relative to the regional distribution of cows, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. And so you can see Washington in the blue, 223,000 uh, on that January 1 inventory, compared to Oregon, 534, Idaho, 513, and Montana, a million four. So you can see Washington has a, a relatively smaller beef cow herd I didn't put the maps in, but the cattle feeding industry and the cattle slaughter industry, it concentrates in Washington. The cattle feeding concentrates in Washington and Idaho. The cattle slaughter is very heavily concentrated regionally in Washington with agri-beef and Tyson. So those numbers are, are real important. And you look, uh, this is the change from 2014 to 2015 regionally on the map. And you can see 25,000 cow increase in Washington. That's just huge. And, uh, and we led the nation on a percent basis. So if you look at things on a percent basis and a percent shock, uh, Washington led the nation in its rate of growth at 13%, Idaho at 11%, and Oregon at 2%. So really kind of a, a, a change in mentality, investment, retention uh, in the Northwest in that beef cow inventory. And so we want to spend a little bit of uh, next few slides talking about the production risk aspects and really talking about competitive advantage of what, our, what advantages we have in the Northwest. And so here's a, a drought map uh, taken uh, March 29th, 2016. And you can see the, the region across the West and what the drought impacts are now. And uh, I just call your attention to New Mexico because I was in New Mexico a few weeks ago and they're abnormally dry. And that's from the plane landing out of Albuquerque what abnormally dry looks like in New Mexico. And I can tell you, I drove around Albuquerque and I was hungry for any cows that I saw and I saw very few cows. So talking about the... Um, regional production risk. So let's uh, look at 2015. 2015, if you remember back in 2015, we were in dire drought predictions and water restrictions. We look at what the hay is. And so in this hay, this is alfalfa, look at the change from 2014 to 2015. There, there was no decrease in, in alfalfa due to the irrigation water through the Columbia Basin system. Very interesting, uh, and regionally over the Pacific Northwest states. And here in the all hay supply, 
Yeah, we do see some decrease because that was going to include the dry land hay acres. We do see some decrease, but if you compare it historically, it wasn't a really dramatic decrease. And you can see that in hay price. And the point that I'm trying to make, a couple points I'm trying to make. When New Mexico and Texas and uh, Colorado had that extreme drought a few years ago, where were they looking to source their hay? They were looking to source the hay in the Pacific Northwest. I got a lot of calls uh, talking about, you know, trying to do some studies, trying to arrange freight and rail transport from the Pacific Northwest down to New Mexico, into that area. And so when you're thinking, uh, and we're thinking about the industry in the Pacific Northwest, that really puts us at a competitive advantage because of that water resources, that resilience to drought, to provide alternative feed sources. And so that's something I think we should keep in mind, and it's kind of pointing to the regional increase in the cow numbers as we, as we look forward. Uh, expanding just the last slide on the production risk, Here's a, a study released by the Bureau of Reclamation. When you get your slides, you can look at the URL and you can, you can look at what their conclusions are. I was at a conference a few weeks ago and all the climate scientists are consistent in these four conclusions. We look at the temperature. Steadily increases with greatest change occurring in summer. High, higher evapotranspiration rates on the plants and, and evaporation because of the summer heat, uh, longer growing season. Uh, on the precipitation, drier summers, wetter autumns, and winters. And, and these factors are happening right now. I can tell you there's a, more than one occasion that I watched Holly lose her muck boot in the mud doing chores in the morning in December and January as it was so muddy in the Palouse country. Uh, the snowpack uh, snowpack is really interesting. We got great snowpack this year. Really sensitive. Uh, in the Palouse it was kind of unique where in the hills we'd have snow and down lower it was rain. And usually it's uh, one, uh, cl one climate. It's either all snow or all rain. But to see that variation in just that little bit of altitude was really interesting uh, through, uh, through the winter. And the snowpack is projected decline due to, due to the warmer temperatures and more rain. And that loss in snowpack and the temperature is going to impact the snow melt and the uh, dryness in the mountain ranges. So that's something that we're going to have to, to look at and, and evaluate. And on the groundwater, there's decreased infiltration because of the higher evaporation, lower stream flows. And so that, those four points are, are emerging now are going to impact us in the future and we're going to have to evaluate how we manage our range as we talked about last night in making uh, plans, being more dynamic in our grazing plans, having resources to move cattle to, and, uh, and evaluating new plans and new strategies on how, that, how we're going to address feeding cattle relative to this changing climate variability. And I didn't call it climate change. I like talking about climate variability because it's the variability. Even this spring, I know you guys were talking about, well, what do I do? Turn them out early because the grass was greening up? And what impacts that has? Um, so any, any comments or questions on that production risk? Yes, thanks. Well, mine's on weather. Wondering, I've been in cow calf business my whole life. When I was a kid, we used to get winter in late December and January. Now we get it in November and early December. What the hell's up with that? Yeah, exactly. Look, yeah. There's something odd. Yeah. The coldest time of year is late December and or late November in December. Yeah, and, and uh, to me, it's uh, you know you you have that historic perspective, and it's hard to move away from that historic perspective. And, uh, you know, and so some people, you know, you look at your calving dates. You know, people are talking about calving early to, to you know, have an early calving date. People talk about, well, I'm going to avoid the winter. But you're bringing up the point, well, maybe the winter's in December, so having an early calving date's going to fit in my production scheme pretty well. You know, I kind of, I can, I can remember them horrible Januarys. We've been calving 
chapters in January. We got a barn. Yeah. But, so I moved everything back ten days. Yeah. And it, you know, thinking about horrible storms. I mean, I can remember twenty below and two foot of snow and you know stuff like that. My kids all think I'm nuts. Yeah. You know, when you tell them that. And and uh, and really, what's in the back of my mind on this? is that uh, this is the year to kind of make some decisions on what you're going to do with your hay inventory. I've talked to the hay growers. I think there's some people that were here at the hay growers outlook and the hay price outlook is pretty, is, is not strong as with all commodities. And, uh, and what better source of management control is to have an extra stack or two of hay around. And this year might be the time to invest in that extra inventory. And manage that inventory and you know work your flow through that on how you feed those stacks but that's kind of a point that uh, we don't have and no, nobody has a strong recommendation on that but I think it's an issue that you're gonna have to think about because you guys are all everybody's dealing with this weather variability and what impacts that has on it fire as we talked about last night you know where are you where are you gonna move those cows and and uh, how are you going to address those restrictions if they come about? Okay, so we can come back and, and talk about that on the conclusions, but I think that's kind of a real interesting point uh, to talk about. And so now I want to change gears and talk a little bit about market price risk and what that price outlook and price changes were. So here in this graph I have Washington calf prices. In the red line is five to six hundred weights and uh, eight to nine weights. And the blue line with the price crash in uh, this, this, this line is January. And you can see uh, the real dramatic price decline starting in the July of 2015. So the important thing to understand uh, that I want to talk about in the next couple slides is what what are, what are the factors that cause that? And what implications do those, are those factors going to pers persist as we look forward? And so th that's what we're going to talk about in the next couple slides. Th this is, uh, so if, if you think back to January 2015, spring 2015, that's this, uh, dotted blue line here. Here's the average for 2010 to 2014 cattle on feed starting on 2015. Early market projections, early market reports, tight supply, 2014 if record high prices, I'm sure you, rec you recall. And everybody was very optimistic about those prices staying strong in the early part of 2015. All the way through and, and the point on this graph is is that it wasn't U.S. supply that caused that it wasn't that wasn't the shock to the system. Supply remained uh, short, and uh, it's certainly short in 2016. But uh, as the supply increases, is going to is is going to grow. Um, lots of lots of things you can say about cattle on feed, Oklahoma uh, uh, winter grazing conditions on the spike on cattle coming into the feedlot. But the point relative to the price break in 2015, it was not U.S. cattle supply. Uh, this is one of the factors on the dressed weight. Uh, this is dressed weight, talking about uh, uh, illustrating the point that you've probably all heard in the market, is that in, in summer, what happened was that there was a closure of a few seemingly small beef packing plants in the upper Midwest. As those plants closed, it was kind of, they were not expected, and those cattle had to find a new home, a, a, a new slaughter outlet. And so that created competition into the system, and that also contributed to that price break. And then this record high steer weight, you look at, you look at July, you know prices were high, uh, feeders were, were trying to take advantage of that price increase by increasing weight, holding cattle on feed a long time, and it increased their weight, and you can see that, you can see that trend uh, through the summertime and then continuing into 2016, 
And that uh, is noted as a factor that's important in what uh, helped contributed to that price decrease. Secondly, what's also important to, that I think had an impact was these imports. Not imports from Canada and Mexico, but imports from Australia because Australia was at the end of a two year drought. They were liquidating their cattle herd because they had no, no feed for them and those imports came into the United States. And so those imports, you can see that peak into 2015, uh, 2014 into 2015. And, uh, and the, the positive note on that is that they've liquidated their herd and they do not expect those imports to continue into 2016. And so that pressure is going to diminish and, and go away. Here I'll give you some more information on Canada in the next couple slides because we're real interested in Canada, what happens in Canada uh, to us here in the Northwest. But uh, dressed weights and imports are really important. Here's uh, total Canadian cattle imports. Uh, we're down in 2013. Uh, these are live imports, just a graph. And, and this table is a little better to, to really put it into perspective because they reported as uh, Region 10. Region 10 includes uh, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. And you can see the change from 2014 to 2015 uh, of an increase in the feeders a real sharp decrease in the slaughter cattle coming direct to slaughter across the border, decrease in the cull cows. And so uh, Canadian sourced cattle into the Northwest is on a declining trend because their cattle numbers are also declining uh, just as we are, starting to recover just as we are. But uh, real, uh, real, real important factors into the whole production chain and we can get into discussing the importance of these numbers into the Washington production chain is, as uh, feeder efficiency and cattle slaughter numbers have become real important. So, uh, so let's move on to a couple uh, uh, other points. Exports, exports also declined in 2015. Uh, usually we have an increasing trend in exports. 2015 they went down, strong dollar, weakening world economies. And so those exports also, as those declined, they found a home here in the United States. So, so we had the increase in imports, the decrease in exports, increasing supply into the chain. And so, uh, so what, what's going to happen in exports, and I'll give you a table uh, of some projections in a minute. But the, but the decrease in exports also contributed to that price change. Here's the good news. Here's this, uh, I really bring your attention to this slide because uh, it's nice to bring attention to good news. Uh, the good news is, is that price break was not a break in consumer demand for beef. And what this graph is, it's the retail beef fresh price. This dotted line is again 2015. And you see in the summertime there's a little weakening but not much. Uh, and so the good news is, is that that price break was not a consumer demand price break, but it was a production chain issue. And we can work through the production chain issue much easier than we can change consumer demand. So consumer demand remains high. Here's, here's the projections. Uh, uh, just what's... Uh, uh, this is from uh, USDA projections on world supply. They released it in March. I pulled these tables from March. Just to put, bring your attention to a couple points in this on the trends. Uh, increase in beef, 9.2% projected in 2016. So we'll have a little more pr beef production in the U.S. as those as those numbers come into the into the feedlot. A little more competition in total meat supply. We increase total meat supply with our competition with pork and chicken. But really importantly, as I mentioned, because that Australian, uh, they're not going to ha have the numbers to import, and so that those imports are projected to decrease 16%. And uh, so we have production increasing 3.6%, uh, and our prices decreasing 7.3%. So 
So the bottom line, and that's finished year's price. So the bottom line is, is that uh, the market projections at this point in time is for some small decrease in prices relative to, to now. And uh, that's, that's, that's the way we stand and what you should be planning your risk management strategies on. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, risk management options. Uh, so so we've explained kind of the price break. Uh, price break is production chain. Price outlook is a little bit conservative. Uh, if you're a manager, you that conservative projection. That's where you should be managing your your outlook. And so now let's talk about some tools of what we could have used last year what's available this year and what the rel and, and some points on risk management. So, so risk management, uh, your risk management is going to, your options are going to depend on your individual financial capacity and decisions. If you have debt that you've used to expand your operation or get into your operation, you're in a much riskier situation and, and you're going to want to uh, pay some attention to this, look at these options a little more closely to protect yourself. If you have a lot of equity in the bank or if you're a smaller producer with a lot of off-farm income, uh, then that risk profile changes. But you're going to have to look at your own individual operation and see what type of risk management options you're going to want to implement. And there's a couple differences. Uh, difference between market risk between uh, grain commodities and livestock. Let's point this out, kind of interesting. If you're a wheat farmer, corn farmer, uh, you go to the bank for your operating loan, you are not going to leave that operating loan without insuring your crop. The, the insurance products for those uh, crops are very effective, very strong return on the investment of your premium dollars. And really what's really interesting is that you, you can insure revenue very effective at insuring revenue, so you get to insure your yield and your price. Unfortunately for them, or for maybe you guys are in that boat too, that revenue trend is declining, and so you're dec you're insuring a lower level. But that but you do get to insure both. For livestock, the insurance product I'm going to explain to you in, a, in the next slides, you only get to insure price. Okay, uh, so. So your so your so your options are you can forward contract a lot of forward contracting going on that's that's good you can use futures markets but for most people futures markets are ineffective because the contract size is is very large and most people don't have that contract size the complications associated with the futures markets are are intense you have to develop a relationship with a stockbroker to execute your trades you're at a lot of cash flow risk as the market changes so. Uh, you know, you, somebody might, might uh, uh, contradict me and, and say, well, these futures markets are really good. Certainly feedlots are using futures markets very well. But uh, for most people in the room, futures market aren't an option. But this product is. This livestock revenue protection insurance product is, is a real option. And I'll, I'll show you some examples uh, of that here in a minute. So let's work on that. So the livestock revenue, uh, feeder cattle, so you can insure your calf crop. You can insure it in Washington. You can insure it on all these red states. So it's available widely across the country. Uh, these are the parameters across the, that program. Let me run through these quickly. Uh, you can insure the steers. You insure a coverage length, 13 weeks, 17 weeks, 21, 26. Uh, all these lengths of coverage periods are available. You can get a price quote, and I'll show you those price quotes in a minute. Some of these longer ones aren't available because they, because they don't have enough action on these longer terms. So sometimes you don't get to get all these lengths. Uh, you, it's like an insurance. You, you can choose your coverage level. You're insuring this expected end value. You're, so you're insuring the sale price when you sell them and you can insure from 70 to 100%, and probably the strongest recommendation that I'll come out, that I'll illustrate to you, concerns this coverage level. Uh, the, the prices are the CME feeder cattle price index. Uh, what your coverage price, what you're actually uh, 
covering is that expected in value times your elected percent. Um, and then there's a policy premium that's calculated you times that price times the weight that you insure, the number of head that you insure. And then the actual is what actually happens. And if the actual is less than the coverage price, you get an indemnity payment. So let's illustrate that. Okay, so I'm really sorry that uh, uh, this is one of the slides that I, that I stressed about presenting because it's so small, but what I wanted to illustrate was the screen capture of what you're going to see if you go to this. And, and so I would highly recommend you go to this uh, URL because you can call that up for free. No obligation. I mean, it's a price quote with absolutely zero obligation to look at and you can get all the parameters associated that I mentioned on the previous. You can have the coverage length, and here I have 13 and 17. Again, sorry, probably only the front row gets to see that, but, uh, but that's what it is. You get the endorsement length. You get what those index values are right there on the screen. You don't have to search for them. Um, and, then the, and then here's the coverage level, the percent. Here's 98%. And... Uh, what the, your premium cost is going to be for those individual levels. So you can go to this and you can look at it and I'm going to give you some more uh, illustrations of this in the next few slides. So, so, so here's, that's where you go to get your uh, price quote. Yes sir? Does that, uh, so that changes every day? Y yeah, it with could change every day. The, with the close of the CME it changes yeah. every day? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, and uh, as in these uh, last, uh, as in this slide, you can look at it historically. They give you a menu. You could look at it for 20, from 20, I think I went from 2012 to your quote going into 2016. So you can look, at if you're a fall calver, you can evaluate your fall calving. I did a spring calving example in, this, in these slides. And, uh, and you can look at those trends. Uh, and so here's 2015. Uh, the, so this is what the actual ending prices were of these dates. And so what I did in this red line is in July, uh, 13 weeks, well July, 13 weeks is, is your October, uh, October sale date, October uh, weaning dates. And in July of 2015, you could have contracted the red line and gotten paid the difference between the blue line and the red line. So I, I, I wish we would have done this in 2014 because I would have given you the same talk last year as this year. Um, but but, that, but, but this, is, this is how this program was designed to function. When there's a sharp break, there's, there's a payment to be made. And that's what it would have been in 2015. Okay, uh, this is this is uh, this is the the second really important take home message on this. So let's we I gotta th this is really important if you're interested in understanding this LRP. Okay, so what do I have here? So uh, I went back historically uh, and looked at the coverage percents, and so I did 95% is the yellow, 90% is the gray. 85 down to 80 and what does this graph show you this graph shows you if it has to be uh, the way I calculated it if it's below the line that's when an indemnity payment was made and, and so what it so look look at these points here uh, which lines had an indemnity payment the highest coverage percent right and so this highest coverage percent all the way through so what what that's telling you is that, as, as identified, it, you're insuring the, the, fee, the CME index. A lot of brilliant people establish in that index. And you're expecting that index to go below what, what you're contracting for. And so it, it, it has gone below, but the, the error is not going to be that great, right? So you've got to pay the higher premium to get to the higher percent in order to trigger an indemnity payment. So that's the take home message on this particular slide and analysis is that if you're interested in that, you're going to have to look at the higher 
indemnity or the higher coverage percent pay the higher premium in order to increase your probability of triggering an indemnity payment okay uh, so what I did <clears throat> so what I did um, was I did I, I went back through that database that 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 uh, URL that I illustrated in the previous slide and uh, worked through the net cash flow of purchasing this LRP if I uh, if I wanted to protect 30 head 600 pounds 98 percent coverage level and 13 weeks and this 13 weeks is kind of a sweet spot in the analysis that I've done so when so look at it in July summertime if you're if you're going to sell your calves in October that's the time to make this analysis and make this decision and uh, and I, uh, I, I just put the net cash flow. I wished I had time to go back and put all the premiums. I could have put all of them there, but this is the net cash flow. You, uh, you're out $59 net in 2011. You were up $234 and 12, down 433, down 1175, and up 4641 on your cash flow investment. And so the, so the point on this slide, on your risk management plan, you might be smart enough to jump in and out. But if you're, but if you're really wanting to manage your risk, you're in it over time. And over time, in this analysis, because of 2015, was, was very profitable. Um, but who's to say what's going to happen in the future? But that's something to think about on your risk profile, where you sit, and whether you want to jump in or jump out. Okay. Sorry again for this small font, but you can look at it. What's really interesting to me on this is how the different states use this program. Okay. So let's look at Washington 2015. Sorry, you can't see it, but I'll read it to you. Washington, they sold 79, 79 policies were sold. It covered seven, seven hundred and fifty-one head. So that's a policy on average is less than ten head. So you can insure from one to several hundred. I I, I can't remember what the maximum is, but but certainly it's not. We're not going to hit that often. Sorry. Uh, so so the point being that you know we're the point being across the country this isn't this program's not being used very much. And so that was one of the things on doing the analysis. Is it the program? Is it the mechanism? Is it the market? Um, but, but there's Washington, 79, 751. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop on the loss ratios. Uh, the, the loss ratio is 1.35, and we could talk quite a bit about the loss ratios relative. One being a break even to your premium. Greater than one, you're pulling more money out of the program than you put in. I'll, I'll run out of time. This is just commenting on the loss ratios of Washington relative to, to uh, the nation. Okay, uh, so I'll take in about another five, five, six minutes, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the next point. I mean, we could, we could work hard on protecting our, our market risk and our price risk, but the fact is, is that you gotta, you gotta gather your calves, you gotta m deliver them to a market point. So let's talk about about uh, producing those calves and delivering them to that market point over these next few slides and producing quality calves and uh, we're going to have a whole day of talking about producing quality calves so it's really going to be interesting and just the some economic my economic perspectives on these quality calves you got to uh, produce calves that are going to are going to quality grade you're going to have to produce calves that have feed efficiency and Dr. Johnson and Holly are going to talk about that about later. Uh, ability of calves to resist disease. Uh, you should ask Holly about her work with the BRD, and and that's going to become uh, that the point I'm making in the next few slides mostly is on this disease and what the risk is with disease and what is facing you on your decisions on producing calves and your ability to produce calves that resist disease production practices that meet beef quality assurance guidelines. Uh, real interesting, on the percent of calves 
or percents of carcasses grading choice. And yeah, I mean, this is going to be, uh, you know, I gave you these, I'm talking about some pretty broad reaching aspects of what's going to impact the future. Here's graded choice up to 72, 70 to 72%. And then you add prime on top of that. Primes are the, the level of cattle grading prime is increasing up from 4%, maybe up to 6% at times. You add that, you're up to close to 80%. So close to 80% of the cattle that are going into the marketing, marketing chain are, are hitting our quality grades. Is that good or bad? Well, it's good for the consumer, but if everything's grading choice, it's hard to, to develop a premium for, for those cattle. And I think that's going to be an issue that's going to be continued to talk about. There, people are starting to write some newsletters on that. But this, but uh, grading choice is real uh, high. Grading is is high. And then you look at the choice select price spread. Yeah, uh, again, the blue lines 2015. You look at uh, you look in the late summertime in the uh, price break that that price spread really dropped. Uh, and seasonal, seasonal going into summer grilling season for the steaks. Uh, just, just some of the market factors that are on that. And I don't know if you're aware of, of this graph, but this is really important. Looking at these cutout values based on these quality grades and how important prime is. But and it's not choice, but it's these branded products. All the way across, branded products are reportedly have a prior price premium. So the Packer branded products, they're going to be choice, but they're they're extracting that premium, and so the market channel they're trying to protect that branded value. Uh, moving to disease risk, consider consider yourself a, a feedlot, uh, and uh, the value of these fed steers have reached year-over-year -year record high prices since 2009 with the price de decrease that in 2015 that we talked about. The point being that it tremendously increases the value at risk, commensurately it increases the economic return to disease management. Uh, and so since that financial value of cattle has gone up so much, pro uh, feeding profit margins are so thin, if you have a, a mortality because of disease risk, it has greater impact because the margins are thinner, if I'm making sense on that. And so it really uh, elevates into the feedlot manager's uh, risk management and cash flow management what's happening to this disease. Um, and my point that I'm trying to make is that uh, feedlots, they have a lot of price risk management, uh, contracting their feed, contracting through the production chain on their cattle values, but the disease risk is a shock. I'm going to show you a really interesting graph on this shock right here. And so this is a from Ho uh, Holly's BRD study data that we've gotten through a collaborator there. And so, um, so what this uh, this feedlot it represents, you know. Uh, over close to 200,000 head of cattle on feed. They ranked them, they gave me their data on ranking of their source lots. This blue lines is the number of source lots that they've identified as sources and you can see the mortality percent really peaked through what they identified as high risk cattle. So they did a good job of identifying high risk cattle risk, but this red line is the predominant number that they ranked as low source risk. And I put a mortality rate at 3% just to illustrate a graph, but what is the right mortality rate that should be? Should it be 2% and all these cattle have disease risk that are unaccounted for? And at 3%, it's all these cattle that, uh, that, that are a shock to their expectations and a shock to their cash flow because they have to have treatments, they have mortality, they have morbidity, and uh, they have quality, carcass quality losses. So, so this source risk is, is really important, and that's a point I'm trying to make for you guys to think about when you're producing your calves and, you're, and they're going into the production chain, your reputation on those calves and producing these quality calves are gonna be real important. And preconditioning programs are gonna, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask you to think about some more. Are you gonna, can you extract value 
from producing good calves, putting them through a preconditioning program, lowering the source risk to the feedlot, are they going to are they going to pay you a premium for those calves and extracting that premium? And so that's something that we need to think about as we move forward on these preconditioning programs and those URLs are some links to some additional information on that. Okay, so I have so the bottom lines uh, and then I'll be done. So uh, agriculture commodities in general are bracing for lower lower prices. It's good for cattle because corn's corn's low. Also soybeans. Uh, the ending stock ratios for soybeans is increasing like threefold. So protein supplement prices should adjust accordingly. Um, there's going to be increased competition in export markets. Our, you know, we talked about what they expected those they expect exports to increase. Whether we hit those export targets is going to be real important to our prices. Uh, expanding global cattle production in Brazil. Argentina and changes in that. Argentina had a change, it really interesting in Argentina, a change in presidency where Argentina was very much a closed beef economy and they're going to be in the export market now because they're going to see value trying to get into Europe, trying to get into Asia, increased competition that wasn't there just a year or so ago from Argentina. Uh, and, and here's really, uh, here's something that no matter what where you're at, this is a recommendation that you should be doing if you haven't done it already, is to know your cost of production, look up the standardized performance analysis accounting methodology and worksheets to get to that cost of production so that when you have that cost of production, you know where your efficiency weaknesses are or what your marketing negotiations have to be to, in order for you to break even or make your, make your profit. So I think that's really something that you could do at relatively low cost that's going to be a first step in risk management. Uh, don't take short-term perspectives on long-term decisions. You're in, the, you're in the cattle market for the long term. The decisions you make today need to be planned for the long term. Uh, we didn't talk much about cow longevity. It's not on the program, but that's going to be a real important thing. Something really interesting to talk to Holly about is genetic improvement versus cow longevity, what your culling rates are, what your stocking capacity is going to be. Uh, really, really interesting economics there. The softening cattle prices are going to challenge you on your risk management. And then lastly, as we started out, what's your, what's your plan for this increased climate variability in responding to that? So thanks.